All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Uh, we will call the Belvedere City Council Committee of the Whole of July 24, 2023, to order. If the clerk will help me with the roll call, please. Albertini? Here. Brereton? Brereton is absent. Flurry? Here. Frank? Here. Freeman? Here. Gramkowski? Here. McGee? Here. Mulhall? Mulhall is absent. Porter? Porter is absent. Snow? Here. Seven present. Okay, thank you. And do we have anybody registered for public comment? We do not. We do not. Uh, I would just make a couple comments here uh, this evening. So next Monday night, uh, so the council members are aware, we do not have a, a meeting next Monday, the fifth Monday. We'll reconvene on uh, August 7th. And then also at your desk, I think there was a fair tent schedule. If any of the aldermen would like to sign up, uh, certainly appreciate it. Feel, feel free to, uh, if at all possible. And moving on, uh, under public forum, item one, Police Department award, Awards Recognition. Uh, Chief Woody? <coughs> you wanted? That was second on the agenda. That was second on the agenda. Can I get a motion then? Uh, or if, no, if nobody cares, Sorry. if there's no, if there's no objection. Matt just took them all apart and put them back together. <laughs> okay. If there's no objection, we can change the order. Uh, if no, if nobody's opposed, tell you what, let's go ahead and go with Chief Woody here uh, with the agenda. We have children here this evening, and I know that's difficult uh, for them to. Uh, so, Chief, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Nick Jacob, I apologize. If I could have uh, anybody else that came for the uh, awards recognition, please step in. Uh, we're police officers. We like to hang out in the back, you know, make sure nobody uh, comes up behind us. It's just the way we are. That's all we're getting? There's four? Okay, great. Uh, Appreciate it, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, for the opportunity. Uh, I will go ahead and jump right in. Uh, tonight I'll be uh, presenting three awards to uh, these three officers uh, for two separate uh, incidents that took place. Uh, first one, um, at approximately uh, 2.50 on December 21st, uh, 2022, Officer Joe Danielak was on patrol in the area of the 600 block of Logan Avenue. He observed a, a male walking on the side of the mobile gas station uh, when the business was closed. He illuminated the subject with the squad car spotlight. Officer Daniel Eck immediately heard the sound of glass breaking as he turned his attention to the front door of the business. He observed the subject climb through the front door and immediately requested additional assistance for a burglary in progress. Officer Daniel Eck advised responding units that the suspects had fled on foot, provided additional units with suspect descriptions, location, and direction of travel, this information allowed additional responding officers from the city and the county to secure the crime scene, establish a perimeter, and begin to search for the fleeing burglars. Officer Daniel Lack chased the burglars to the 500 block of Warren Avenue, but eventually lost sight of both subjects. As Officer Daniel Lack was assisting with the third subject that, it, that was detained in the area of Mobile Gas Station, uh, deputies uh, Gosnell and Van Acker continued to search the Warren Avenue area, ultimately located both burglars as well as items stolen in the burglary in the 500 block of Warren Avenue. Officer Daniel Ack, your alertness, initiative, and exceptional attention to duty resulted in the capture of three individuals that were victimizing one of our businesses. On behalf of the City of Belvedere and the Belvedere Police Department, you're hereby presented with a Meritorious Service Award. Thank you. That will be the second award that Officer Daniel Ack has earned. Uh, the uh, uh, second incident will be for Officer Corns and Kirk, Corn and Kirk. 
Uh, on June 17, 2023, officers Korn and Kirk responded to an emergency medical call for service for a 50-year-old male who was overdosing after injecting fentanyl. When officers Kirk and Korn arrived, they located an unconscious male, bluish gray in color, slouched on the floor of the residence. Officer Korn immediately administered Narcan to try and counteract the effects of the opioid. Officers laid the man on the floor, began checking for signs of life. Once they confer confirmed the man wasn't breathing, had no pulse, Officer Korn began performing cardiopulmonary resuscitations, CPR. After a short time, uh, the man gasped for air and officers were able to find a pulse. At this point, Officer Kirk assisted Belvedere Fire with life-saving measures until relieved by Belvedere Ambulance paramedics. The man eventually regained consciousness and survived thanks to the quick actions of all of the first responders. The life-saving measures taken by officers Kirk and Korn presented this, prevented this person from a fatal overdose. On behalf of the City of Belvedere and the Belvedere Police Department, they are hereby presented with life-saving awards. This will be the uh, first life-saving award for Officer Korn and the third for Officer Kirk. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief Woody, and uh, thank you to Officer Danilak, Corn, and Kirk. Um, I appreciate you bringing this to the council and bringing it to the public. Uh, without uh, these type of awards, uh, we certainly uh, would have no way of knowing. So thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. And thank you to your entire department. Uh, item two on the agenda, presentation by Hosea Levine. Associates regarding the Belvedere Comprehensive Plan. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Nick Davis, thank you. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for giving us a few minutes of your time today. Uh, we appreciate uh, being able to go over really us kicking off this comprehensive plan project. So we're, we're just getting started. Today's our, our really first day out here, um, meeting with staff, meeting with uh, the Planning Commission and with City Council, uh, met with department heads. So we're really excited to get this project started. Um, just wanted to give a, a brief overview today. So I, I don't have a, a lot to talk about. It's really just uh, a little bit about um, our team who's working on this project. Uh, just want to give a brief overview of what the planning process is, why we do comprehensive plans, um, and what the purpose of, of these overall documents are, and then uh, just a little bit about next steps and where we're going. So with that, um, my name is Nick Davis. I'm a principal at House of Levine. Uh, House of Levine specializes in community planning. So we do comprehensive plans, downtown plans, corridor plans, um, really all kinds of studies uh, that ultimately result in drafting policy and recommendation <laughs> Uh, to you know, achieve a community's vision, achieve a community's goal. So we work uh, throughout the country. We're based here in the Chicago region. Um, so you know, we kind of have the opportunity of both knowing what's happening here locally, but also pulling best practices from uh, really throughout the country. So it's a, a great way for us to bring some of the ideas that we're seeing on the East Coast or what they're doing in, in Colorado, wherever it may be. So we, we see that as an, as an opportunity or an advantage. Um, we do have experiences in a wide variety of, of planning types um, and then the, the bottom one is we're, we're a firm that <laughs> finds ourselves to be a fun firm we think we're enjoyable to work with um, you know we, we take our jobs very seriously we don't necessarily take ourselves that seriously but uh, we do think the work is important and what we want to do is make sure that as as we establish these working relationships and we have these discussions <coughs> it's our job to thread a lot of different input points throughout um, all the different discussions we're going to have both with elected officials uh, with community residents business owners stakeholders 
Um, so it's a big it's a big job in terms of taking all that input and writing a plan that is your vision, that is what the community wants to see, um, and then giving you a document to use to make future development decisions moving forward. So uh, what I want to do, and I, I briefly introduced myself, there's a few people who weren't able to make it here today, uh, but the core of our project team is listed here. So myself, uh, Trisha Parks, who's a senior planner, and she's been with us almost, almost 10 years. Um, she'll serve as our project manager. She'll be our day-to-day -day, uh, working with the city, but also with Jacob and myself. Um, Sam Lenick, uh, who's also a planner. And then Jacob's in the back, Jacob and <laughs> Jacob Wave. So Jake and I uh, have been out here today, uh, did some initial recon, had the opportunity to drive around town with uh, Gina and learn quite a bit about you know, what some of your issues are, what some of the opportunities are. We'll be out here over the next few months doing more and more of that type of work. Um, but as I said, this is really our, our first kick into uh, the project. So with that said, I just, I just want to talk about why we do comprehensive plans, because they are policy documents. Um, you know, they're not regulatory. We're not saying what people have to do. Um, but it is, it is your best way of communicating your vision, both um, from this group, from the elected group, uh, to the residents, to your business owners, uh, but also to you know, future development opportunities. So what a developer might want to do or a future property owner might want to do, one of the first documents that they're going to go to is your comprehensive plan. So it's a blueprint. It sets the stage for what you're trying to do over the next 20 years. Um, it assesses the city's existing issues uh, and opportunities. It's, it's very aspirational. So it's identifying what the desires are, what your needs are, and ultimately uh, with the vision and the goals, will give you those tools that you need to start to clearly dictate or articulate what you're challenging or what you're asking developers to do or property owners to do you know, moving forward. Um, it has a broad range of topics, so we'll talk about land use. You see a couple of plans here in the back, um, different land use plans over the years. We're going to establish a land use plan for your current municipal boundary, but we're also going to look out past the boundary. We're going to look at areas where you have boundary agreements with surrounding communities, and we'll plan out to that, um, to that distance. It doesn't mean that we're saying in the next 20 years you have to do all of this, but if it is to occur, if, if development does occur in some of these spots, we just want to make sure we're on the same page about what those uses should be. Um, and it informs the decisions for growth and informs decisions for future development. I always feel like that's really important. I know I just said it, but I just want to reiterate. Um, it's one of your best tools to help somebody understand what you're trying to accomplish in areas that right now might be undeveloped or for areas right now that are underperforming. So when they do come in um, and they're looking to, you know, do an industrial property or uh, do a townhome development or you know, really any type of use, is it consistent with your land use plan? And is it then therefore consistent with your zoning code? And so this is the first step to make sure that we're all on the same page about what that property's use should be. Um, and then with that, this plan is, is dynamic. It'll change. Um, you know, we're, the goal here isn't to, to do this and then to come back to it in 20 years. Every couple of years, every five years, you should be reviewing it, updating it, make sure that it's current with the times. Um, every 10 years is, is typically a more thorough review and update of the document. So you don't want to just finish this plan and put it on the shelf and be done with it. You want to keep using it as a tool, and you also want to make sure that it stays current with the time so you're not 20 years out and um, it's, it's you know, ex extremely obsolete. We're trying to avoid that. Um, it's a three-step process. So we're in, we're in step one right now. So we're project kickoff. We're doing existing conditions. Over the next, I'd say, about month or two, uh, our team is going to be breaking down a lot of the data that we've received, reviewing past plans and studies, looking at things that are happening in the county and in surrounding communities, um, and really establishing a baseline for what is uh, Belvedere, what are your challenges, what have you done in the past. Um, it's all, I would say, it's very much baseline work. So it's not us saying what you need to do. It's just us uh, documenting what's been done so far and making sure that we have a, a good understanding, a strong foundation before we move into the next phase, which is the vision statement, the goals, and the future land use plan. So one of the things that we often get asked in this first phase is what do you think we should do? And at this point, we don't have those recommendations. I've seen things across the country that seem similar, um, but until I have a strong understanding of, of why some of what's happening is happening, um, it's too soon for us to give those recommendations. So that's why we do this existing conditions phase uh, before we launch into step two. When we do get to step two, we'll have a community visioning workshop. Um, it's not gonna be just our ideas coming to the table. Uh, we'll have a, a workshop that allows everybody from the community to provide their input, their feedback, things they'd like to see. Um, it'll be less about issues and more about aspirationally, what would you like to see in a specific area? We'll have big maps out, everybody can draw, give us some ideas. That's when we then convert the whole process into providing recommendations. So 
Um, that's about halfway through the project, so we still got a little bit of time before we get there. Uh, but once we do, we'll be back. We'll present those findings to uh, both this group, but also those that are invested along the way, um, re-engage with department heads, uh, also making sure that we're talking to stakeholders um, or potential focus groups, whatever that might be. The last phase is the draft and final comprehensive plan. Um, pretty straightforward. That's when we take all of these pieces, the vision, the goals, uh, draft land use plan, some additional considerations, and start to put that into a document. Um, we'll bring that through for review. We'll talk to the Planning Commission. We'll make sure it's uh, vetted through City Council. Ultimately, once you've adopted it, this becomes your document to guide decisions in the future. So you'll use this as an evaluation tool for future projects. Um, <clears throat> so next steps, and I talked about this a little bit, is <clears throat> in August and September, we'll be doing key stakeholder interviews, some focus group discussions. Um, we'll start and continue to develop the existing conditions report. Through October and November is when we'll deliver that existing conditions report, that assessment, um, and we'll also start to look into scheduling some, or scheduling a, a community workshop, so that visioning workshop. Um, probably gonna be the, towards the end of October or into November, these are dates that we'll have to work out with, uh, with city staff. Um, and then once we've done that visioning workshop, we can move into preparing the vision statement and the goals and preparing the key recommendations memo. Um, the key recommendations memo is very helpful. That's really us outlining what we're gonna talk about in the draft plan before we go too far. So it'll give everybody an idea of seeing what the vision should be, what the goals should be, uh, and then what we think the overall structure of this document needs to be. So with that, and I know, I know I went pretty fast there, but if there's any questions, any comments, things that you would like us to consider as we move forward, uh, now would be a time. Sir? Or did you, no, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you raised your head. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> when are we thinking the final completion of the comp plan? I know you kind of walked through the steps, but when, what kind of time frame are we looking at? Yeah, um, I would say, because it is a three-step process, uh, I, you know, I want to say six to nine months. That was our goal. Um, the only tricky part, and I can even hear myself when I was saying it, scheduling a visioning workshop in November and December can be tricky um, just with the holidays. So those are, those are things that we got to work out. Um, our team can do this study in typically four to six months. It's the outreach that, you know, we got to be mindful of. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that if we hold an event in the last week in November, we're probably not going to get the turnout we want. So um, I think once we lock down what the date of that visioning workshop is um, and have that visioning workshop, we're probably – you know, three to four months out. So, yeah, I would say at the latest in the first quarter of uh, 2024, which is, I can't believe I'm talking about 2024, but yeah. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yep. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about is the cost. Yep. So it's been, this, this has already been approved. Uh, the cost of this study is 49980 um, That's to prepare everything, to do all of the workshops, to do all the materials that we need to pull together. Um, to also facilitate discussions and prepare the document itself. Um, I don't know if there's additional costs. What will come out of this plan, and I, it's, it's the nature of why we do these studies, is an identification of future studies that you need to do that are separate from a comprehensive plan. An example would be, you know, in coordination with your park district who's currently doing a comprehensive plan, there might be a joint venture that you two want to work on. Or um, it might be just making sure that you pull back on the comp plan recommendations because you know the, parks, the, or the park district is working on it. Um, there'll be other studies, like a specific corridor or intersection improvement that you'll want to do. But again, all of that needs to be talked about and discussed at a high level before you go out and start doing very specific studies um, beyond what a comprehensive plan can accomplish. Uh, uh, just to remind the council, it was uh, approved budget, 25000 in last fiscal year and 25000 in this fiscal year um, is the budget you approved <coughs> as the council. So the funding has been reserved. Okay, any other questions for Nick? Okay. Yeah, I have another one. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Um, so who else would you be working with? Uh, obviously Gina mm -hmm. and the mayor, mm -hmm. and then who, other leaders in town? All, all uh, we actually had a meeting earlier today with the department heads. Uh, a lot of what we do, although department heads have very specific agendas of what they need to accomplish too, or, or scopes. Um, a comprehensive plan touches a lot of different services throughout a city, so we've been coordinating with them. We'll continue to coordinate with them. Um, as part of our scope, we identified uh, 12 different stakeholder meetings and focus group discussions. So those are meetings that'll be facilitated over the next two months. Um, that's an opportunity for us to talk to longtime business owners, um, local commissions, whatever it might be, 
Uh, so those are groups that we'll identify over the next few weeks working with city uh, staff to make sure that we talk to the right amount of people or the right people. Um, and if there's other groups that we need to be talking to, that's something we can talk about when we come back during the visioning workshop as well. Any other questions? Looks like you got one more. <laughs> no. I'll, I'll ask the mayor. Go ahead. Or, or you can ask later. Oh. It's up to you. Yeah, I could ask the mayor later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, Nick and Jacob, thank you very much for coming out. Um, I will say that uh, Gina touched on it a little bit earlier that it had been quite some time since we'd had a comprehensive plan and it changes. It's changed rapidly even as we speak. Uh, we've had uh, certain uh, business, economic business opportunities that have taken place in Belvedere with um, some opportunity that still uh, it changes every day. As a matter of fact, I was just informed last week. Uh, that there was going to be a potential interest in some property and then uh, again this morning. So the comprehensive plan, uh, what it was and uh, was outdated and uh, we had been neglect uh, to be able to come forward with another plan <coughs> as well. It is so important because whatever we do with our development, uh, how we plan our land use here is so important because we're only going to get one crack at it. And also, we have to be able to afford the services. I know some of the discussion that uh, was geared around this uh, presentation earlier today was, um, you know, some of the things that we would like to see Belvedere become or in Belvedere, and uh, those cost money. So we have to be very, very prudent about how we um, develop our land so that we get the best bang for the buck regarding property tax uh, revenue, sales tax revenue, retail growth, uh, light industrial, and what have you. So it is very important, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you very it. much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, so could we adjourn the... Uh, Planning Zoning uh, Commission meeting. Uh, Mr. Druckery, should I call that for you? Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion. Okay. Um, if there's if there's no other discussion, um, motion to adjourn the Planning Zoning uh, Commission uh, meeting this evening. Uh, Hearing no other discussion, all those in favor uh, of the commission members, please say aye. aye. If there's any opposed, okay. Motion passed for the record. Uh, that adjourned at 6.26 p.m. Thank you. Uh, moving forward with our agenda this evening, reports of officers, boards, and special committees. Item one, uh, public safety unfinished business. We have none. Uh, item two, public safety new business. Uh, item A, Police Department update, uh, Chief Woody. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, since my last update, uh, recruits Ochoa and Venegas are currently in week 13 at the Suburban Law Enforcement Academy. Uh, recruit Bendel is in week 12 at the Police Training Institute. Uh, the Police Department has a Fire and Police Commission meeting this Wednesday night uh, where we'll be discussing two entry-level applicants, polygraphs, and conducting interviews of those applicants. Uh, they will, uh, the applicants who pass will be given conditional offers of employment and approved to take psychologicals and medicals. The police department is down two officers. Uh, we currently have three in basic academy, one in step two of the FTO process, and three are on long-term medical. For a total of nine officers, we have to cover on both patrol and in the detective section. Uh, we're currently working with the Fire and Police uh, Commission and Attorney Holsworth, who's the attorney for the Fire and Police Commission, uh, to create language for a new entry-level testing process. Uh, the next step is for Attorney Hullsworth to meet with Attorney Drella uh, in preparation for presentation before the Committee of the Whole uh, to request the city to exercise home rule authority to change a couple of statutory requirements. Uh, I would anticipate that language uh, be brought uh, before you within the next few weeks. That would conclude my uh, update. Okay, thank you, Chief. Any questions for Chief Woody? 
Hearing none, we'll move to item B, the fire department update. Chief Shadle's not uh, with us here this evening, uh, but Captain Burdick is here. Welcome, Captain. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, there's no uh, fire department update on behalf of Chief Shadle. Okay. And item C, we have fire department uh, operation helping heroes donation in, in your packet. Um, you had a memo from Chief, Sh Chief Shadle and uh, I don't want to speak for Captain Burdick if he wanted to chat about this. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Again, uh, just no, just pretty much want to reiterate what the memorandum says uh, on behalf of Tyler and Bruce. They've been very fortunate to present uh, two $1,500 grants to us, and they are planning on uh, attending the second reading of this, which will be uh, August 7th, uh, once approved. Okay. Once approved. And uh, so the donation uh, would be for um, three thousand dollar donation uh, from Tyler and Bruce Nelson from Country Financial at 130 South State Street. Um, the memo which you have in front of you uh, would culminate with uh, a motion here this evening, uh, a motion to accept three thousand dollar donation from Country Financial's Operation Helping Heroes and to utilize the funds to purchase an iPad, cell phone, uniforms, and training for the new inspector that will be hired on August 7th, 2023. Could I have a motion that effect, please? Motion by Alderman Snow, second by Alderman Fleury. Any questions, any comments uh, regarding that motion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed, thank you, and item D, fire department resolution authorizing an intergovernmental agreement for participation in Mabus Master Agreement uh, 2022. Again, in your packet uh, from Chief Shadle, uh, there's a memo regarding uh, Mabus Mutual Aid uh, Box Alarm System. Uh, it is, I believe, boilerplate. Um, and uh, Captain Burdick, if I'm wrong, if you could correct me or if there's anything you would like to add. No, this is just a, not a whole lot of changes, just a formality and continue with the Mabus process. Again, as it says in the memorandum, uh, there is a valuable asset to us and it has uh, made a world of difference in our, our larger responses. So we hope to continue with that. Okay. And with that being said, uh, I would entertain a motion uh, to adopt resolution authorizing an intergovern intergovernmental agreement for participation in the Mutual Aid Box Alarm System, known as Mabus Master Agreement 2022. If I could get a motion to that effect, motion by Alderman Albertini, second by Alderman Fleury. Any questions or comments, Alderman Snow? So in the section on page 10, it talks about insurance and keeping a certain amount of liability and that stuff. So generically speaking, what does happen if there is a um, <clears throat> call for service whether it's our guys or somebody else comes in and they wind up getting hurt um, whether it's a an injury whether they wind up on workman's comp or long-term disability what who winds up footing that bill is it the each community covers their own employees um, the one caveat to that is and it doesn't handle the work, issue with workers comp but if there were a, dec uh, a a declaration of a catastrophe by the state or the feds uh, if money comes back into the Mavis system, then that is allocated amongst the member participating municipalities that responded to cover some of their costs. But each community covers their own employees. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Frank. Thank you, Mayor. I have two questions. One is just informational. How long have we um, adopted Mavis? For many, many years? I don't know when we exactly adopted it, but we've been part of the Mabus since I've been here for 22 years. Oh, good. So okay. we've been active, very okay. active with them. And then my second question is, is there an annual cost? No. No cost involved. Great. Thank you. Okay. Helping uh, one another out, I think, is probably the theme, and being available to help one another out. So, Any other? Thank you. Any other questions? Captain Burdick? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion on the floor then, uh, please say aye. Aye. If there's any opposed, motion passed, thank you. And item E, Fire Department Collection Agency Service Agreement um, in your packet. 
you have a memo from Chief Shadle, and that memo is regarding the billing for ambulance service um, and the need to collect past due balances. Um, for your review, there are three proposals for collection services uh, this evening, one being uh, mm -hmm. Lifeline, uh, LifeQuest, uh, and their fee is associated with that at a 15% rate. Item two, Bull City Financial at 20%, and item three, Wakefield and Associates at 28%. Um, as you can see, there was one uh, asked for response uh, that they did not receive. Chief did not receive. Uh, the proposal and contracts are in your packet uh, this evening. Uh, with that being said, I would entertain a motion to enter an agreement for collection services provided by Lifeline Billing Systems, LLC, DBA, LifeQuest Services. If I could get a motion that effect. Motion by Alderwoman Frank, second by Alderman McGee. Uh, any questions, any comments regarding that motion? And Mr. Mayor, if I could. Just a clarification of those maybe watching at home. This Lifeline is not Lifeline Ambulance that uh, provides services. This is actually a company that's a subsidiary of the same company that's providing our billing services currently. Um, so you get an economy of scales, I think the chief known as Memo, because they'll have all the same documents and access to the same records as they, as they produce their collections opportunities. Assuming this passes tonight, um, I may or may not ask you to postpone it. What comes back to council? Hopefully not, because we have two weeks to get to get there. But uh, looking at the agreement, I'm sure some of you have some questions. I just had a chance to review that this morning, and I've got a call into them to ask them to make some changes just to clarify what counts as a delinquent account. When does the 15% kick in versus the lower rate we have for billing? Things like that. So it will come back to you in a slightly different form in two weeks. Okay, Alderman Snow. So what is the length of the? Um, agreement for or is it until one of us terminates yes well actually it's I take it back it's an amendment to the existing contract the way they draft it, and that surprised me it's an amendment to the existing um, billing agency contract I believe that one was for four or five years I'd have to check and get back to you on it Mayor, I, I believe it was through 26 and then either party I think had 120 days if you wanted to cancel the agreement yeah, that was on the paramedic. Actually, that was on the paramedic side. I think it's the same for the EMSMC Should be. billing. They're all related. Okay. Alderwoman uh, Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, Attorney Drilla, I didn't have time this weekend to go through this, but did you just say a lot of this is going to be changed when it comes back anyway? Some of it will. I have to talk to them because I'm not sure exactly what the consent to changing, but, you know, if you look at it, they've got essentially two active clauses where they talk about we're agreeing and they say we agree again, and they don't define in here what is a delinquent account. I want to make sure that jives with the, uh, with the other agreement that we're party to as far as the billing goes. So we have clear understanding when they'll be receiving their, I think it's 4% for billing versus 15% for collections. Okay, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed and it will, uh, I'm sure we will note the changes uh, from the agreement that you have in front of us, uh, in front of you this evening. Uh, moving on, item three, finance and personnel unfinished business, we have none. Item four, finance and personnel New business, uh, item A, finance department update. Uh, Shannon Hansen. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a few things to share with council. Um, to date, the city has received approximately 55% of its total tax extension for the year. The next di distribution is scheduled for August 25th. Uh, as far as grants, as you know, uh, after a public hearing last Monday evening, council passed a resolution for the mayor to sign a grant application for disaster relief funds. In response to the clean up, cleanup after the March 31st tornado, I'm pleased to say the application has been submitted and a tickler has been placed on the file for the end of August to check the status if no word has been received. In addition to the disaster relief funding, the city is also working on a number of grants through Senator Stottleman and Representative Vella totaling over $1.5 million. 
If received, these grants will cover items and projects such as infrastructure, community development, violence prevention, and operational expenses. We will keep you updated as we work through the application process and hopefully of subsequent notices of funding. And then finally, um, as shared previously, we will be bringing to committee in August a revised investment policy for consideration. We're also hoping to introduce a purchasing card policy and procedures manual at that time as well. Okay. Any questions for Director Hansen? Okay. Thank you, Shannon. Item five, other, we have A, a resolution uh, permanently dedicating a portion of Logan Avenue as Jeff Smith Memorial Avenue. Uh, in your packet, uh, you had <coughs> you had a resolution to dedicate a portion of um, Logan Avenue as Jeff Smith Memorial Avenue. Uh, for those that don't know Jeff uh, Smith, Jeffrey Smith, uh, he asked, they asked this dedication be called Jeff Smith uh, Memorial Avenue, uh, but he was a Marine Corps uh, officer in the Marine Corps. He was um, killed in 1968, March 7th of 1968. And I believe he was the only that I know of, he was the only Belvedere resident uh, who was killed in action during the Vietnam War. Um, I was made aware of it. I was in my office one day, and a um, gentleman by the name of Tom Steinkamp came into my office. Um, he asked me if I was aware of it, and I was not. He shared with me a book that his brother John had written, um, and his uh, name, I believe, is John Edwin, and he goes by Jedwin. They thought that was a better pen name, I guess, than, uh, than John Smith. So, But John uh, was here uh, after he had written that book. He was at the museum here in Belvedere for book signing. My in I'd read the book. I'd read it twice. Uh, my intent was to meet with uh, John and his wife, June, uh, at the museum, and then I had come down with COVID and was sick. Uh, very sick, so I wasn't able to make that. However, I did call him, and they live in Georgia, and I had some conversations with with John and June both, and um, because of uh, Mr. Steinkamp coming in and bringing me his book, I actually felt that uh, after I read the book that Belvedere could do much better. Um, his family left Belvedere. Um, they were just... Um, really tough on the family. Uh, they left the city of Belvedere, and after I read the book, I realized that um, looking in the rearview mirror, they probably didn't want to see Belvedere again. Um, I did reach out to John and explain to him that uh, uh, we had just done Logan Avenue, and I thought that it would be a good opportunity to honor uh, his brother Jeff uh, for his, not only his service, but his ultimate sacrifice. So um, what you have in front of you is um, a resolution uh, permanently dedicating a portion of Logan Avenue as Jeff Smith Memorial Avenue. <coughs> and if I could get a motion to that effect, please. Motion by Alderman Fleury, second by Alderwoman Gramkowski. Um, and if there's any questions or discussion, I'll try and answer them. All right. Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of that motion on the floor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. And item B, oh, before I, before I go there, um, so we are planning, <coughs> bless you, we are planning an event uh, in conjunction with the family. Gina has helped me uh, with this event. Uh, it's going to be uh, during the fair. Uh, it will be August 12th. Uh, there will be some information forthcoming regarding that. It will be uh, um, a memoriam, a memoriam uh, regarding Jeff Smith uh, and also regarding the dedication uh, of Logan Avenue uh, to Jeff and uh, his remembrance. That will be at the VFW. That will be at 10 a.m. on the 12th. Uh, I had asked the family 
uh, when they said they were really touched and they, they were moved by that, uh, I'd ask the family what dates would work and they have some friends and uh, family that are going to be coming around the fair time, so they thought it was a good time to uh, do this event uh, based upon the fair. So um, please keep that in mind, but there'll be some information forthcoming as well. So thank you. Okay, item B, uh, City Council meeting times. Um, Alderman uh, Albertini had put a memo in the packet, uh, and he would like to uh, change uh, the City Council hours. Uh, his uh, memo states uh, he would like to make a change to uh, City Council meeting hours. He would like to see regular uh, Monday council meetings start at 6 p.m. I'm not going to speak on his behalf other than read the memo, but I will uh, entertain a motion uh, to, in, uh, to that, and then I'll ask him uh, any questions that he can ask. Uh, he can, can go to him and he can answer. Could I get a motion to that effect, please? Motion by Alderman Albertini and a second by um, Alderman Snow. Uh, any questions? Alderman Snow? So I don't know for sure, and I thought about this, John, after you had um, mentioned this, but I don't know if the rationale of having the 7 o'clock meeting was that with uh, most of the staff and everybody else um, getting off work at, generically at 5 o'clock gives them enough time to make a meeting like this. Um, the other is that council meetings, as you can see, are fairly short, the 75 minutes. The um, committee meetings tend to run longer potentially because that's where most of the discussion occurs, except on those rare occasions when the people want to drag it out at a regular city council meeting instead of addressing the issues beforehand. So that was my only thought. Um, I don't have any big um, issue with changing it. Um, but if anybody else had any input, I'd appreciate it because I'm assuming this has been going on for um, a long time. And Mr. Morris, you've been part of this um, council at any given time for dating way back. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, I think Alderwoman Frank had her hand up, then Alderman Fleury. Well, um, Alderman. Albertini had his hand up, so I would like to know, like, what it was his reasoning for changing it. Was it personal or professional? Sure. I think he there can you answer go. that. Sure. <clears throat> Let me quickly read a few ideas of why I thought it would be advantageous to change these, and then we can kick it around. My first was every Monday I have to go to Linda Heiser's house and remind her at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock for her group to watch. This would be one less task on my half. Um, it would also prevent me from being, <laughs> sorry, it would also prevent me from being early or late to certain meetings because it would be consistent. Um, it would give us a chance to get home early to our families, um, to spend time with them in the evenings, um, say to play cards, watch TV, whatever it is we all do with our family. Um, if you can make it at 6 o'clock for some meetings, I don't see why you couldn't make it for the other meetings. Um, this would be also advantageous to the employees of the city government. Um, it would be less time they have to hang around and wait to come to the meetings. Um, they can get to them, do the meetings, and get home to their families as well. Um, and my last thought was Monday night football is coming up. So it would be nice to be home for that. That's okay. my inputs. There's probably more, but those are the basic reasons I started this thought. So if you have any questions, I'll entertain them. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Alderman Albertini and uh, Alderman Fleury. Thank you. I think uh, when I first started on council, I had a similar idea. And some of the, uh, the pushback, and I agree with a lot of your things, uh, what you said, but uh, the consistency I thought was a good idea, but one of the uh, pushbacks that some of the council members have brought up is just that by having the later evening at 7, it gives, for public comment, it gives uh, constituents an opportunity to come to the city council meeting that normally may not be able to make it at 6 o'clock. So I don't think it was an issue of 
all of us being able to make the meeting, but more of a constituents be able to have a uh, opportunity to speak at at the public comment portion of it. So that was, I think, the only um, pushback last time of why no one, why people wanted to stay the, the way it is. Alderman Frank. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, thank you, Alderman Flory, because that was exactly what I was thinking too. But I did some, um, I asked some questions. I guess when it was under Mayor Cunningham, the meetings all started at seven. And then in 1997, somewhere between 1997, 2000, under Chuck Pop as city attorney, they did, they did change it for the same reason that Alderman Flurry was saying. But um, I'm not in favor of changing it for a personal reason, but if it's a professional reason, um, that's a different story. But I, I think that we should keep it the same if we're gonna change it I would think we would want to change it to be the same as county board hours and their first two meetings are at six and then their third council meetings at 630 that's a compromise so I just wanted to add that to the discussion it's ultimately up to the votes okay thank you uh, Alderwoman Gramkowski how long has this meeting cadence been taking place do you know how many years Oh, I don't know, probably, uh, I would imagine 25, 30 years, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Yeah, maybe maybe more uh, for, for quite a while. The one thing I know in the past, uh, it has been brought up, and I, I certainly understand uh, Alderman Albertini's points, and uh, they're well taken. Um, one of the things that had been, in, that I had always um, taken into consideration before and I know some of the other mayors did uh, had as well was that when we have people that are here for the council and we have decisions to make sometimes they're from out of town sometimes they have to travel and uh, not to say that they couldn't get here uh, on time uh, at that time but it does make it a little bit easier I think it's to accommodate them if they're coming out of Chicago or coming out of uh, coming a distance and that's the only thing to me, um, that's the only thing that I can think of that hasn't been discussed here yet this evening. Uh, from my perspective, it uh, really doesn't matter to me if I'm here. Uh, a lot of times I'm here anyhow uh, after five o'clock uh, to six o'clock or in this case, or uh, at seven o'clock. So that's a council decision um, based upon, as Alderwoman Frank said, personal or business decision uh, that's up to the council, certainly. but. I know in the past that's one of the things that had been discussed that hadn't been brought up. So, city attorney, one of the benefits to having a computer in front of me is I can look at things in real time. Believe it or not, your code—we can change it by ordinance—but your code sets the time for city council meetings, and it sets the time for your city council meetings on the first and third Monday of every month at seven o'clock p.m. Again, we can change it by ordinance, but we'll have to go through the first and second reading process. That has existed since before 1982. I can tell that looking at the code. The committee structure was modified quite some time ago. There used to be separate committee meetings for each of the subcategories, and us, all the other elements assigned to that committee would show up for those meetings. It was modified to a committee to the whole, and I want to say that occurred in either 2000 or 2002. Um, that hour of six o'clock is not as an ordinance, but uh, that's been around since at least that time. So you're asking about times. And so if you do wish to change it, we can do that. It would have to come back in ordinance form though. Okay, thank you. Alderman Snow. And I'd be interested in having, um, we have half the people in this room are um, staff or elected officials that um, may not want to be here that late as well do you guys have any input for us as to the logistics rather get it over and done with like having the time to get off work at five and have dinner and come back or you get rushed uh, any thoughts i can start mayor it doesn't matter to me you know either way we can i can be here um when i had young children the seven o'clock meeting was actually better because i could go home have dinner with them put them or get them ready for bed and come back from the meeting 
but that's a purely personal reason. Other than that, it just doesn't matter. Okay. Anybody else want to? Well, it oh. doesn't matter to me, but um, when constituents call, it is confusing to tell them the different times and the different meetings. They get confused very easily. I do notice when people come for annexations and other things, they want to be first because they want to get out of here. It's the opposite. They don't need more time to get here. They want to leave here to be home to their families. Thank you. Anybody else? Any of uh, department heads want to weigh in about if you have any preference? Yeah, I mean, my uh, preference truly would just be for consistency's sake. Uh, Six o'clock uh, um, would just uh, be easier for people to remember, uh, plain and simple. Uh, I know my wife and I have this conversation every week, and, you know, I taught her, uh, you know, uh, 246. Uh, you, you're second and fourth meeting are always at six o'clock that, that was the best way i could come up to you know teach her how to uh, remember it and she still struggles but. i guess i guess i'll admit it one time about six years ago i was sitting at my kitchen table eating dinner getting ready for my city council meeting when i realized and it was about 603 that it was a committee night so i sh showed up a little bit late <laughs> anybody else it, it's it happens i even forget uh, sometimes uh, what they are uh, luckily, Sarah puts them in front of me on my desk so I can pay attention. So, Alderman Frank. I was just going to say, I, I I work a lot. And so sometimes the 7 o'clock, is a, it's nice to have a break that I'm not rushing for a change. But I just want to remind everybody, we're paid servants. We get paid to be inconvenienced. <coughs> Point well taken. Uh, Alderman Fleury. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of good discussion, but I think just for consistency sake, I, sake, I think the, it makes the most sense just to do them all at 6 o'clock, so that's what I would agree with. Okay. I'll, I'll, thank you. Alder, Alderman Snow? And I agree that the consistency, because um, my wife and I used to attend before I became an alderman, and it was always, you know, you got to remember which week we're on. And it was uh, consistency. I get the point about constituents showing up. Um, I would guess that if somebody had an issue and they could contact the administration, um, allowances could be made for somebody to have a, um, a thing toward the latter part of a meeting. Because um, generally speaking, um, unless it's a big controversial issue, it's not something that we're going to sway our vote. They're just bringing up concerns that they want to tell everybody. Um, so I'd be in favor of um, keeping it consistent and converting it back to a 6 o'clock meeting all the way. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Older woman, Gronkowski. So if you do move it to 6 o'clock and you're late, what, how much time determines when you're absent? If you show up, you show up. Yeah. I would mark you absent at the beginning of the meeting, but when you arrive, I just put in the minutes when you arrived. And if I may, Mr. Mayor, it doesn't need to be part of the motion, but uh, the Open Meetings Act requires us to publish our yearly's worth of meetings. I believe it's in January, correct, sir? No, I, I do that by fiscal year. I do it by fiscal year. So it we it would not help us waiting until December. Um, yeah, okay. We'll just go ahead and republish them then. I was thinking otherwise we'd start it in January because we're more than halfway through the year. I see what your thought, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, whatever the pleasure of the council is, uh, from my uh, perspective, it doesn't, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Uh, I have uh, caught myself uh, a time or two um, realizing that I was going to be uh, late uh, or the fear of being late at the last minute. So I get it, uh, consistency. Certainly, uh, like I said, uh, really doesn't matter to me. A lot of times I stay and I'm here regardless so whatever the council chooses we have the motion then uh, and a second on the floor if there's no other discussion could, other, could we do a um, roll call vote only because I think it's going to be it's going to be too close to call a nay or yay we could certainly we can do a roll call vote uh, the clerk will call the roll on the motion please Albertini aye Fleury aye Frank nay Freeman aye Gramkowski Nay. 
Mickey? Aye. Snow? Aye. Five in favor? Okay. Uh, you'll see that again here and the council level. Um, item C, motion passed, thank you. Item C, uh, executive session to discuss pending probable or imminent litigation pursuant to section 2C11 of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, could I have a motion to go into executive session, please? Okay. Motion by Alderman Snow, second by Alderman Flurry. Uh, the clerk, all those in favor, uh, the clerk will call the roll, please. Say aye. Any opposed, nay? Flurry? Aye. Frank? Aye. Freeman? Aye. Gramkowski? Aye. Mickey? Aye. Snow? Aye. Albertini? Aye. Seven in favor? Okay. Uh, for the record, we will go into executive session. Uh, that'll be um, uh, the motion was uh, approved at 6:59 p.m. Uh, you take, give me a moment. I'll get us off the air. And okay. We'll take a few minutes. If uh, somebody has to 